Even in those first cave paintings, they, they portrayed horses with more than four legs. They portrayed horses with multiple legs. So did the horses have eight legs? No. What do you think they were doing? They were portraying motion. And then there's Vitruvius. Um, the, the duplication of the image here, uh, the Vitruvian man the, here depicted by uh, Leonardo, uh, the implication, what, what Vitruvius was talking about is that the source of all experience is the human body. Does that sound familiar? So we're back in phenomenology. So this lecture starts with a deep anchor in the world of phenomenology. And um, all the things we studied uh, in the phenomenology section of the course comes back here with a vengeance. Uh, but it goes beyond what we talked about a few weeks ago to deal with um, how human experience is not just something uh, that our eyes do or the, the other senses. Um, there's a principle called proprioception that uh, phys uh, physiologists are now, uh, because we have CAT scans and magnetic resonance imaging, we now realize that it's not just the brain that is uh, processing these things. It's the brain in conjunction with the entire body. So there's a vast literature about this it, it runs through uh, physiology of humans. It runs through art theory, uh, especially through the 18th and 19th century when art historians, art theorists speculated that the reason we respond to art in a certain way has more to do with uh, the body than you might think. Uh, if we are standing close to a painting or far away from a painting, it matters a great deal. Uh, there were scientific studies done about how the eye moves around a painting in, as part of the appreciation. And it spec they speculate that the muscles that are activated in moving the eye from right to left, much less the human body right to left, has one, it, it imprints itself on the human memory in one way. And it's very different from moving the eye up and down. Moving the eye up and down is a much bigger deal in terms of physical experience. And it registers on the brain in a very different way than moving side to side. And so, and then the final one is the moving in depth. And this was the big one. Uh, there was a theory that we respond to the depth, the spatial depth depicted in a, in a picture, a painting, because this is the 18th and 19th century we're talking about. The spatial depth causes a very specific physiological response in human beings. And it has everything to do with our muscle memory. So the example from a few weeks ago of when the child bumps their head on the edge of a table, and from that moment forward, they carry the memory of the bumping of the head. And it starts out as a conscious memory. I'm going to stay away from the corner of the table and it becomes a reflexive memory. I don't have to think about or even consciously recall the pain I felt in my head. I just automatically avoid banging my head. So we move from that to the world of proprioception of all artistic aesthetic experience uh, that was theorized in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and this study of this um, spatial experience through art uh, extends into social experience. This is, um, the next few images are um, referred to the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who died in 2002, but uh, before he died, he transformed uh, the study of sociology. And one of his most valuable contributions was the introduction of the idea of reflexive sociology. He is the one who really brought this word into popular uh, usage in the social sciences. What he was talking about, remember when in the introductory lecture there were two 
senses of the word reflex. One was the automatic unconscious action that occurs when the doctor hits your knee or the thermostat detects uh, that it's now time to turn on the air conditioning, etc. So it's the automatic uh, unconscious response. The other uh, definition of the word reflex has to do with referring to the self or a process that acts upon itself. And so the idea of reflexive sociology is really the second one. Bourdieu pointed out that we, psychi uh, we social scientists uh, cannot simply look at the rats in the maze. We are rats in that same maze, and we are influencing the things we are studying. So it's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Which way are, hey electron, hey particle, subatomic particle, which way are you spinning? Um, the particle responds, I'm not going to tell you unless you ask me a more specific question. And, the part, and so the scientist says, okay, are you, do you have a positive spin? What does the particle say? It says yes. And then it goes to the next particle. Do you have a negative spin? What does it say? What's always the answer? Yes. So it's very disturbing for a scientist to uh, be confronted with a situation where by studying something, I change what it is. By me asking the question, I alter the outcome. By me taking a photograph of you on the first day, I, I altered what you looked like. Right? You knew I was taking a photograph of you. It wasn't a neutral, candid photo. It was posed. So, and social sciences have to face the fact that when we study human subjects, we influence the behaviors that we are supposed to be studying independently of them. It is a reflexive operation. So we have to study the way we are studying and take that into consideration with what we are observing. And so Bourdieu did something else that's interesting to architects. Have you ever heard of Bourdieu before this class? Yes? Okay. Is it because of architecture? Okay. The reason architects love Bourdieu, and I'm, you just have to take my word for it that architects love Bourdieu, um, is he went off to this village in Algeria, uh, controlled by the French uh, in the 1950s, and he studied the villages, and he studied specifically the spaces of the house in relationship to how women operate. And he noticed that um, the spaces are very much the st structuring factor that control the presence of women and their existence in that village. Women are not allowed to be seen in public in this Islamic uh, society. Uh, so uh, very early in the morning, the women can walk down the main street and go to the well because the men are not up yet. But once the men are up, there is a back alley that the women can take. Uh, when the men are out in the field, the women can leave the house. But just in case a man is not out in the field, the women have to take the back alleys to get the water, because all over the world, it seems like women get water. Um, that's still true today in a lot of places. Uh, similarly, in the house, the windows are quite small. Uh, on the upper floors, which is the realm of the women. Typically in the Islamic uh, house, there are screens that women can see out, but uh, people outside cannot see in. Um, and so it's a highly structured um, society in terms of uh, gender. Um, uh, but it's... Um, it's structured in a way that manifests architecturally and in the formation of the village. But the odd thing is, uh, some of Bourdieu's biggest ideas all had to do with space. And he came up with the theory of the habitus and the, the doxis. And, and these ideas have to do with the fact that, and it's, very, it's been very influential in the idea of reflexivity as presented in this course, because Bourdieu is the one who came up with the idea or the most powerful articulation of the idea 
that spaces structure the way we behave. The whole thing about, I want to go into the next room, but I can't. I have to follow. The, the architecture is structuring my behavior. I have to go out the door. I can't go this way. Um, and that's connected with the structure of the village. But for all the talk about space, Bourdieu never drew anything except maybe this. He did a lot of diagrams, but this is as close as we ever get to Bourdieu's uh, representation of space. And it's very frustrating because all his ideas are spatial, but um, he would not draw or allow it to be drawn if his life depended on it, it seems. So if only we could send a team of you back in time to be the ones drawing the space for Bourdieu so we could get the graphic depiction. This is someone else's depiction of the village um, that we're talking about, Kabila, uh, Algeria. Um, and even today, you know all about burqas and the importance of uh, the differentiation of gender behaviors uh, in public space. So um, Bourdieu is a very important point of reference for those two reasons. He's the father of uh, reflexive sociology and thus reflexivity in the social sciences. He's also, not coincidentally, uh, the most powerful, responsible for the most powerful articulation of the way architectural spaces structure social interactions. And so if you put those two things together, the documentation of space uh, and social forces, you get uh, the word sociography. So sociography is the study of how social forces operate spatially. So the spatial operation of social forces is, in a way, the tagline for sociography. And the graphy part of that is the documentation and analysis. Geography is the, is the spatial and otherwise analysis of space. Sociography uh, is a very similar related topic, but focusing on social operation. And so um, to really capture the way bodies operate in space, uh, we have the camera and we have the 19th century experiments with time lapse and strobe photography. Uh, Edgerton at MIT, um, this is Murray, and we have Moybridge. Um, Murray's. Um, Am I pronouncing, do you know, this photographer, Murray, I think. Um, he did these uh, studies of uh, fluid dynamics um, in space. And then we have Moybridge studying human and animal locomotion. Um, and so we have these ways that are quite aesthetically wonderful uh, for studying the way human bodies, the focal point of aesthetic experience, and how they operate within spatial framings. Here's a hurdler clearing a hurdle. Uh, and the locomotion uh, of the leg. Now, does this look familiar? Have you seen things like this before? What comes next? What do you think the next slide is going to be based on this? Ah, I could have done that, couldn't I? No, I did this one. See that? So um, some people speculate that there is a very direct connection between the kind of visual experience of the human body that was opened up uh, through photography in the 19th century and uh, uh, innovations in the world of painting and aesthetic experience that follows close behind that. This is um, Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase. And then there's a whole realm of uh, Italian futurist painting. The Italian futurists, if you ever get a chance to read, assuming you didn't in last summer, um, if you ever get a chance to read their manifestos, it's fantastic literature. They talk about the human body and these imminent forces that, that are escaping from the human body. If you've ever seen sculpture by Brancusi and you see these human forms 
with these bizarre shapes. These are the forces that Brancusi was imagining exuding from the human body. This is a very clear, uh, oh, not for you. It looks beautiful here. Um, very sociographic. And so we get to other, we'll look at it on the uh, video. You'll see, so this is for the video. Um, it's basically, it looks like a strobe light uh, of, a, of a riot. So something about the Italian futurists inspired them to capture political forces acting out in public space. So people putting their bodies on the line at risk of life and limb. Uh, Syri think of Syria uh, in the last few weeks and months. Uh, people putting their lives in danger to deliver a message. There's something about the human body in public space that carries a very powerful demonstration effect. Um, and we see it repeating throughout history not just in the riots captured here, but in uh, the Occupy Wall Street, uh, et cetera, movement, and in the protests of the Arab Spring. And it seems that it has always been so and will always be so. So what is it about the power of the human body in space, and specifically contested uh, space? How does the human body in space contest, uh, engage in contestation of space? And here you see a photographic documentation of an intersection, um, a very interesting condition. Um, William H. White's uh, Secret Life of Social, uh, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Raise your hand if you haven't seen that. OK. Um, artists have been using the power of time-lapse photography um, with great effect. This is, these are some of the spookiest images I've ever seen. Um, the competition between the automobile and uh, the human body has very powerful sociological effects as demonstrated in uh, David Appleyard's uh, documentation of a street in um, San Francisco uh, of human relationships. Um, people who live on streets with a lot of traffic have much fewer uh, social relationships than people who live on streets with very low traffic. So there is an inverse relationship uh, that suggests that there is competition between people and people's cars or people in cars. Um, there is a great deal of social life that is displaced by the automobile. And this is something we know intuitively. Um, um, there are ways of capturing human motion through space that uh, have come up because of um, computer-aided technologies. Uh, there's also been uh, a shift in um, architecture in terms of attitudes towards the human body. It used to be that uh, whenever we wanted to photograph architectural space, we'd have to say, OK, someone, get those people out of there. We are, we got, I'm trying to take a photograph of the building. Get the people out. Um, and Iwan Bon, have you heard of Iwan Bon? Uh, he is the hottest architectural photographer anywhere. If you look at his site, it's basically Every superstar building built in the last 20 years, he's the photographer who took the pictures of it. Here's uh, the infamous Infinite Plaza of Brasilia. But he's, to hear him talk, he's, he's breaking the taboo. He's putting people back in architecture. Uh, the first taboo he breaks is he puts people in. Um, these are all Iwan Bon. Um, so he puts people in even when it's dominated. Um, the second taboo, and there's Burj Khalifa, is he's take, he's, he's the, we're, when we do architectural photography, we're supposed to do a close-up, use a long lens, and cut out all that ugly stuff around it. 
but he doesn't do that. This is the uh, famous photograph of Michael Maltzen uh, project in Los Angeles. He breaks the taboo instead of showing you know, it in tight, tightly framed, he shows the context, which is quite stunning. Michael Maltzen is one of the more famous uh, graduates of the Wentworth program. Um, what else do we see this approach? Um, we see it uh, quite dramatically in uh, Spielberg's um, Schindler's List. Well, we don't really need the sound, do we? Um, but it's a black and white shot, and this girl has a red coat on. I'm sorry the quality isn't better. Uh, but on my screen, you can, you basically, we're tracing the route followed by the girl in the red coat. Do you remember this scene? It's one of the more um, disturbing parts of the film. There she goes in the red coat. The version on the internet will be a bit clearer. And then in this bizarre twist, the camera pans over here. And even though we saw the girl in the red coat over here, she shows up over here. And it's some type of, you know, to bring out my film analysis hat, it's some type of uh, universalizing, you know, to represent the uh, hundreds of thousands of, of children who were victimized. Anyway, um, maybe I'll make this... In the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, but here's the film sh shot. Later in the film, you, again, you see the red coat um, on the part. And the, um, the, um, the film, the, the movie poster makes reference to the girl in the red coat. Um, so to quickly... Um, look at some of the, com the new developments of computer-aided technology allows uh, the capturing of some of these things. Um, this is a famous series from the um, architect David Rockwell, where he uh, partnered with a Broadway choreographer to analyze the movement of human bodies in space. And here we have uh, the concourse of the uh, Grand Central Terminal which was one of the great choreographed spaces in architecture. Um, and I'm not sure why. Uh, this is, um, these are spaces that were captured by the uh, artist and choreographer Nell Breyer, who uh, working at the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, that's Boston Common. Um, these are a study of dancers. Um, Sorry, these aren't resizing automatically. Um, but the new graphic computer-aided techniques for tracking the body in space has led to some possibilities that um, are open to use by um, architects. This is actually a sophomore, uh, or actually a junior studio project by Kara Plaxa, who graduated from here uh, last year. Um, this is a study I did at, um, at Harvard Square. Um, I'm going to quickly, this is, um, there's a movement uh, all over the world. Every Friday night, the last Friday of the month, there's um, a mass bicycle ride through the city streets and cities all over the world. And um, basically, bicyclists are putting their bodies in the street, obstructing traffic but laying claim to the space of the street. This is a, a film, a video of a car reclaiming that space by plowing through the bodies of, um, of the bicyclists. And I don't know why it jumped to this. Um, but uh, let me get back. This is uh, a depiction of uh, a choreographer, William Forsyth, in um, analyzing 
uh, dance choreography that uh, he's been working with over the years and using computer-aided technologies. First of all, he notates it uh, in like a, 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 a scripted way uh, using this very uh, interesting technical uh, language of computer. And this is the, the, the choreography that we're seeing. It's time-linked. And he also does this very interesting thing where he does this graphic, he uh, applies a filter, and the computer actually traces the motion of the dancers and the linkages uh, between dancers at different moments in the choreography. And so uh, it's the kind of uh, technique that is being deployed by artists, by scientists, by choreographers. And the question is, at what point is this trend that has been kind of indicated by Iwan Bon and his reintroduction of the human body in space, uh, when are architects going to get into the act and use the human body in architectural drawings and models and uh, depictions as a way of mobilizing the reflexive feedback loops uh, that we look for in the process of architectural design. If we are designing for humans, why not test these spaces prior to human occupation to see if it works for humans? And so this is some of the technology that is available to do that. So um, between now and Tuesday, what I'd like you to do is the, there's a reading on Blackboard but instead of doing the usual uh, active reading, exploratory writing, blog posting, I would like you to spend that energy um, in the exploratory uh, writing of your term project. Uh, I want you to do the reading. Uh, it's an eight-page, uh, similar to what I've just presented in this lecture since I'm the author of it. Um, I would like you to do the reading. We're going to talk about the reading. But on Tuesday, what we're going to focus on is uh, what I'd really like you to do is I'd like you to take your cameras, your video taking tools, uh, your laptops, whatever tools you can come up with um, to see if you can come up with... Um, Something, boy, this thing does not know where it is. Something like that last thing we saw. Can you do a time lapse? Can you do a time lapse uh, exploration of bodies moving through space? That's basically the assignment. Um, I want you to read the reading and be ready to talk about it, but I want you to spend the time you would usually spend on writing and, and all of that to produce a piece of uh, either a still photograph using um, showing the body in space or um, a video technique, um, maybe with some kind of filter to show the body in space. And um, And this is one of the things, this, these are examples that I think are quite, this is fairly easy to do. These are simply time-lapse shots of different cities around the world that show the, the contrast between stationary elements and moving elements. And those moving elements tend to be bodies and vehicles. Um, and so this is the type of thing I'm interested in testing. And more specifically, can you capture uh, in scenes like this the reality of experience of space? That we don't feel comfortable occupying Huntington Avenue because every <coughs> few months a college student is killed there. Um, we're comfortable on the sidewalks, but we're not so comfortable in Huntington Avenue. Unless you're going to close it and have a street fair, 
And maybe that's why it's so thrilling to sit in the middle of Times Square, where the traffic has been closed off and it's been reclaimed for human occupation. So this is the kind of thing um, I'm interested in seeing you come up with for Tuesday. Any questions about this assignment? Yes, Chaka. Um, we're going to focus our readings. and uh, We're going to do the reading. Yes. Yeah, listen to the lecture and read the reading, but you don't have to write about it. The writing is based on our term project. But for Thursday, do some exploratory writing between now and a week from now. I focused on your term project. So this is the assignment for the next week. Listen to the lecture again. Do the reading. But instead of doing the exploratory writing and the blog, take some pictures that capture this kind of character. And for next Thursday, do some exploratory writing on your term project. So I'm lightening up the Tuesday thing because this probably won't take you as much time. It'll take some tinkering with your camera. Does your camera do time lapse? Some do, some don't. Uh, do you want to try it with video and then bring the video into Photoshop and try to process it? Or an iMovie, find a way to, to process it into a still image or something like the choreography that we saw. Um, so just tinker with your electronic gadgets to see if you can find something that captures the distinction between the stationary and the mobile objects in, in public space. And take less and, and then spend more time on exploratory writing to your term project. Try to find examples and link them together. Yes, James. So outdoor public space, not an indoor space? Um, it could be indoor, but it should be have this quality to it. Okay. Like, some people are treating the public space as a living room, and there seems to be, there has to be some negotiation with other people who are treating it as their way to get to work or to get home. And the kinds of conflicts that can occur when spaces are, are needing to uh, perform both of those tasks at the same time. 